Let's see, try this again. Yep. It's not if you have problems with your computer, then I can do it. I believe should, should be good to go now. Right. Yeah, decided to lock up for whatever reason at the worst possible time today. So, so this should be in presentation mode. Everybody should be able to see it. Does yes. that look right? Yep, correct. All right. Go ahead. Minimize this. Okay. So sorry for the technical difficulties there, guys. Um, I uh, vetted all this out earlier and the computer decided to not work right now. So, um, but I appreciate everybody joining on here today to talk about some of the, um, the work that we've done here at Ingevity looking at how warm mix asphalt can be incorporated into um, balanced mix design and really what the value of low temperature is. So, or, or making mixes at lower temperatures. So we'll start with kind of a, a brief history of warm mix. Then we'll go to talking about what we really call is like a three or four pillar kind of approach, talking about the performance of the binder at lower temperatures, talking about the performance of the mix at lower temperatures. And then we'll talk a little bit about some application stuff with warm mix. And then we'll get to um, the, you know, what, how does that, how is that incorporated into pavement design? So, you know, just jumping off the history of warm mix, you've got really two decades highlighted here, right? You could go back further, right? There's some emulsion base and cold mix stuff and some different research things going on in the 80s and 90s. But really in the first decade, the 2000, 2010 decade, you're seeing a, you know, a really in research intensive phase for the development of warm, warm mix. You're seeing warm mix demonstrations of the world of asphalt, the first few field trials in different states in the U.S. Um, you got task groups forming. Uh, then you've got basically by the end of 2010, you've got all states have done a warm mix trial everywhere in Canada, and you've got over 20 warm mix technologies in use. Then you fast forward that to uh, the next decade. If, if, you, if that first decade is like a development decade, then the 2011 to 2020 is like a rapid expansion decade. You've got you know, if, if it could be studied, it was studied, right? NCHRP dash whatever, you got long-term field performance and, you know, wrap and wrap with warm mix and moisture susceptibility. You've got stuff going on the, uh, the, you know, all your studies from the NCAT test track are now old enough to be viable and different things. So a lot of um, these two decades really highlight where we've been, but where's warm mix going in the next decade? And that's kind of what we want to talk about a little bit today. And you see this expansion um, you know, a lot of you guys have seen the, um, these NAPA surveys. Some of you guys may even participate filling these out, but um, you basically, this is a chart from the most recent, the 2019 data. And it shows on the left here, you've got basically all the companies. These are companies that have used warm mix. They've all, all the companies out there that are interested in using warm mix have tried it um, middle of this past decade and that expansion decade. It's even tapered off a smidge, actually what it says on here. But also interesting to note, the amount of tonnage going warm is continuing to increase. Still got an upward trend there. So um, this is this is noteworthy that you see this is the same companies, right? Same pool of people out there, contractors, but the amount of tonnage is going more and more warm. Uh, then you look at this, right? 10 years ago, 2010, 2011, you've got 90% of warm mix being put down as foam. So we've learned more about foam, right? We've learned more about additives. And we're now up to like 50% 2019 data almost is put down using some sort of additive. So we see more tonnage going warm, more additive use. Why is that, right? That's one of the big questions we try to ask ourselves as additive suppliers. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons, right? If people like using warm mix for cold weather paving, or maybe they're doing a fiber free um, SMA or an OGFC. So that helps the constructability of that, you know, turn the temperatures down, no drain down, better film thickness, um, density, bonus, compaction aid. But, um, you know, we've really looked at a lot of the people we think are using it for one of these uh, benefits. But are they really using warm mix to lower temperatures? Um, some of that same data we're looking at on this chart here, you've got that, uh, I guess it's the middle row there, warm mix technologies used at warm mix temperatures only. And you've got about 28% of the companies said that that was the temperature. Um, so we think that if, if lowering temperatures is important, we have to showcase that, right? We have to showcase that to the industry, why that's important and what that'll do for um, the pavement. So this next section, we talk about 
if lowering temperatures is really helpful, does it show up in the binder data? If it does show up in the binder data, it should show up in the mixed data. And then we should be able to design around that. So that's kind of what we're going to target here, launching into what we call this three, three pronged or three pillars approach. So our first thing, starting out on just looking at the binder data, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. A lot of you guys work in, with, you know, or have some familiar binder testing. Um, but you know, you have you have your plant atmosphere and you have your field at, your in service aging. So the plant uh, system we have is process dependent, right? We have control knobs. We we can change the temperature, those type things. The in service is you know environmentally dependent and is largely predictive, right? We have some decent predictive tools. We try to do different aging protocols to match um, certain number of field aging. The PAV comes to mind, uh, 20 hours supposed to match, you know, seven years it was thought initially, maybe in, um, in a climate like Wisconsin, that's, that's a decent um, guess. And, and think in our work here, we just kind of assumed five. Um, some places in the Southern US think it's a lower amount of uh, the PAV matching the aging prediction, but, um, Going far from there, we know we have we have our two tools in the lab to kind of replicate that aging, right? We've got the rolling thin film oven, short-term spurt aging, uh, harsher environment. And then we have the PAV at pressure to mimic um, field aging. So the first thing we notice looking at data, right? The first thing everybody checks on the RTFO is the mass loss. And these are two binders out of the Midwest. You can see one of them, especially the orange one, is not a really good mass loss system. It's, uh, you know, you got, you're losing almost 1% mass loss at your 325 uh, RTFO conditioning temperature. So that's a little bit disappointing. Uh, but if you drop that to 275 on both these, you see a pretty good reduction, right? Almost 50% reduction, just dropping the, uh, in mass loss, just dropping the RTFO temperature. So I was like, well, will, will we see that in other, other applications? And the answer are with other binders. So we kind of blew that up and we're like, all right, let's look at um, how many binders can we do? So this is just an example of eight, but the, and these are better mass loss binders, but you could see, you know, kind of an average of 0.3 mass loss and you drop to 275 or typical warm mix temperature and you're down to 0.1. So, uh, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4% mass loss saved on an individual project, probably not going to be very much cost per tonnage right on that project. But if you think about it as an overall state metric, if you're doing several hundred thousand, you know, liquid tons a year of asphalt um, or more, then you're going to, you know, 0.3% is a pretty big number, right? That's a lot of tons. So um, the other piece of that, I think we kind of all inherently know, it's like we're not losing, in the mass loss, we're not losing the stiffening piece of the binder. We're losing the maltines and the, uh, the aromatics and the, the, uh, the light ends, the things that keep our binder resilient is the, are the, the components that we lose when we, when, when, due to temperature. So some, something to think about there for different states and how they, um, how they look at binder. Um, but moving on from there, so if we lose some of those pieces in mass loss that we could keep in running at 275, what does that do to the binder? Um, so you've got this is just a general, um, this is just the same 6422 in each scenario, but we've varied the RTFO temperature. So this is the typical hot mix, yellow line is 325F. So if we turn the temperature down to 275F, it's interesting to see, you know, you have the RTFO aging over here on the left side, that steeper slope, it's a harsher environment. And then the PAV aging, 20 hours, 40 hours, you see that, um, not a lot is, not, you know, you've got a, a, a slower slope there going up um, for the PAV, less change per hour than the RTFO system. But you can see kind of RTFO system with the blue line, you've got uh, a lower temperature uh, and, and that showed up, right? You've got a little bit less stiffness as it's just G-star for sine delta at 64. And so that it's interesting to see though that that gap that was created from the lower temperature initially is maintained throughout the PAV aging. So it implies that if we keep the if we keep the desirable parts of the binder in our asphalt, it will, may help us age better. Uh, and conversely, the 350 line, so that's an even harsher environment, right? We're going to be much stiffer starting out of the RTFO, and then that gap is also maintained. 
um, as the binder age. So you see, you know, it can be, you can give yourself an advantage in the starting point there at the plant, or you can be a disadvantage with things being overheated. So, and it's interesting to see how that gap is, is kind of maintained throughout the, uh, the course of the uh, PAV aging, which is our tool for mimicking, you know, field aging for binders. Um, so then we took that a little bit step further. It's like, what if we create some real world scenarios here? So we have four different scenarios. You have um, the red line is a 64 minus 22 virgin mix, 350. So get it hot, maybe a cold day, whatever the scenario is. Um, then you've got a yellow line here, same 64, 22, but this is a 325. So more normal hot mix temperatures. Uh, and then you've got two blue lines. So same binder, 64, 22. The blue line with the square has a 10% ABR and that's done at warm mix temperatures, 275. And the X or the star dash thing there is at 25% ABR. So you can see kind of right off the bat with this is our PG low temperature testing. So out of the BBR, 20 hours, most of these are pretty clustered right here together. The, uh, the ones with wrap maybe a little bit higher even with the warm mix temperatures and the hot mix when a lot of degradation at 350 in the RTF. So if making our mix at 350, we immediately cost ourselves just on the cracking potential of that binder. So, but then as you age, you go from 20 hours to 40 hour PAV to 60 hour PAV, you see some differentiation. These blue lines are made at warm mix temperatures, even with the wrap in there, are resisting aging better than the two mixes that were virgin made at higher temperatures. So it's interesting to see that still kind of backs up our data that says if we keep our better parts of our binder in the system, we're going to stay, we're going to resist aging better. So then you can look at data different ways, right? So one way people slice it is the Delta TC. Uh, it's become popular in different areas of the country. Um, I know it's, it's not necessarily a spec in Wisconsin, obviously, but um, uh, same sort of story, right? So the 350 binder starts out at a minus three delta TC. So already kind of not looking great. But all these other ones kind of start out around zero, zero to one. Uh, the cooler temperatures starts out a little higher in this example, even with the wrap in there. But as you age it, you know, 40 hour PAV, 60 hour PAV, you can see the binders made at warm mix temperature really resist that creep in the delta TC while um you see these just dropping off right you've you've overheated those asphalts and um they're not resisting aging as well delta tc metric um maybe there's some that aren't as familiar with that you know we have the the bbr is our tool for measuring the stiffness and of the low temperature binder and we get a temperature based off of the stiffness of that beam in the bbr and we get a temperature based off of the uh the relaxation parameter or the m value so if those disagree those come up with different PG ratings because the stiffness is way different than the M value, then, that, then the Delta TC number is saying that that's an indicator that your binder is going to crack. Um, so interesting to see Delta TC and how it's going to penetrate in the market. But this test shows, you know, this binder data shows that the, uh, the cooler temperatures held their Delta TC values, whereas the other, um, other binders did not. Um, then there's Glover Row, right? Some areas of the country look at Glover Row. You've had, you know, really maybe 20 years back, I believe it was Candle in Pennsylvania at that time, did a study kind of correlating ductility to cracking, field cracking. And Glover took that further, you know, when, when rheometers have become popular in the last 20 years and he correlated the DSR value to um, to the cracking. And that's kind of what's on the left here. It, then Jeff Rowe kind of partnering with Glover have further refined that, that parameter, but sim similar story to what we were talking about earlier. So if you have, if we think about Glover Rowe as in a stiffness metric at, at intermediate temperatures, we plot the, uh, the G star log G star versus the phase angle. And at one, 180 KPA, this yellow line, that's where we say that a binder is starting to get into a damage initiation zone, maybe starting to crack. And then this red line stiffness, 600 KPA, we would say, okay, we're now at, um, we're now at significant damage. We're at block cracking, we're at wrap levels. So you wanna be further to the right on this, on this graph on the left. So you can see the blue lines starting further to the right, just with that cooler temperatures and resisting aging better at the 60 hour. These guys are up in the block cracking, the higher temperature, 
binders are and the warm, warm mix binders are still further away. And you can um, you can slice this data different ways. It's a different type of chart on the right, um, looking at the PAV conditioning hours compared to the Glover row parameter. And you can see the, the yellow and the red line climbing up into the, into the damaged area much more quickly. Uh, you can also slice it this way, which is one of the ways that I think showcases it best. You look at the PAV aging hours on the bottom, uh, but you kind of look and see, you, you can see maybe around that 70% remaining life. So maybe we, we'd be thinking about doing an, um, a surface treatment or maybe some sort of fog, some sort of seal for our roads and different, depending on what your preferred surface treatment is in your area of the country. You can see the 64 minus 22 virgin mix hits that line about 38 hours, maybe something like that. But the, the 20, the, uh, the 10 percent wrap line isn't hitting it till about 50 hours. That's actually like a 30 to 40 percent improvement on the amount of hours it takes to start cracking. So um, Glover Roja gives us some interesting tools on how we can break down the binder aging with time, which I think are pretty useful. Still shows the same story, right? Though if you have you make your mixes at cooler temperatures, your, your binder should age better. So there's different, you know, there's, there's other ways to slice this too, right? So modifiers, uh, recycling aids, um, rejuvenators, same, different terms for similar additives in different areas of our country. Um, this is another analysis looking at the low temperature binder, right? Low temperature data. So you start out, um, you've got this yellow line, which is once again, uh, so this is, I should say, this is a new, this is a different binder. This is a different 6422. So same sort of data, new binder. So you've got a 35% wrap mix here with the blue done at 275. You can see it starts out stiffer, but 40 hour PAV aging, it's actually already outperforming. Um, your control, even with that wrap, just based on the lower temperatures, keeping the better parts of your binder in your system. Then you go down and you say, okay, what if we, what if we grade dump? So you've got a 5828 on here with um, warm mix. And you see that's a nice shift change, right? You've got that lower um, PG temperature to start and you're aging well over time because you've got that, um, you, you didn't overheat the mix to begin with. And then you can add some other items on here, right? You can add, what if we'd used a modifier or a recycling aid or rejuvenator? So there's two different scenarios here, right? You see the red one, people, they did a 35% wrap mix and they put in, and they did it 350 because it had a lot of uh, recycle in there and they were worried about compaction. And you see it starts out with the 5828, right? To begin with, right? It's at a minus 27, looking good, but, aging over time, we overheat that mix, we lose some of our, we may even cook out some of our rejuvenator, right? So if we're cooking out our volatiles and things we want to keep in, we're also probably cooking out things that we're putting in. Um, and so that mix actually doesn't age as well over time. You'd be better off to run it warm. And the 15 years later, you would have been better off running it warm without a rejuvenator or without a change. So that's pretty, pretty interesting to see. We can, yeah, the green line, another good example. So it's the same mix as the red line, just done at cooler temperatures. And you see that, yeah, step change, that, that line, that, that performs really well over time. So a lot of cool things we can do with our mixes right now, right? Different additives, but if we overheat them, we're going to damage them. It's kind of what this data suggests. So if you push forward from here and we think about um, you know, are we going to see the same thing in the Delta TC? I think we would expect to from the earlier data, and this kind of shows it again, right? The 6422 is dropping off. It's, it's a pretty big negative numbers here after 60 hours. Not great even to begin with. And you can see the, the blue line that with, even with 35% wrap, the cooler temperatures, this is holding its Delta TC better. Um, it's got the same sort of shift change, right? This, the, with the, the green with the rejuvenator or modifier at 4% is passing Delta TC, uh, even at 40 hours, kind of like some of those specs, different areas of the country suggest. Um, the red one, which was overheated, is not doing as well, even it's the same system. And then it really tapers off later on as you continue to age. So do we see that, you know, that's cool. You see the binder data, that makes some sense, right? We keep, if we keep the better parts of our asphalt in our system, we should age better. Do we see that in mix testing? So that's really become popular, right? With um, balanced mix design, super trendy. Um, so we wanted to showcase if this shows up in balanced mix design, we need to be able to see it and, and verify that. So we kind of put together, we've gone forward and we're still pushing to add more data, but to look at 
you know, your Homburg and your, a lot of this data is ideal CT because, you know, it's gained in popularity quite a bit the last few years. Um, but we'll kind of just start out with an example on bind balance mix design and how the warm mix can impact that. So if we think about on the, the blue here is the, is the ideal CT value. So this is, a, this is an example from an Alabama mix, actually, where they're looking at setting a minimum ideal CT value for their balance mix design specification that they're starting. So in this example, they've got their ideal CT index. They need a minimum of a 70. And then on the other side, you've got your rutting, you've got your Humber wheel tracker passes to 12 and a half millimeters, and they need a minimum of 10,000 passes. That's what they're requiring there. So you've got both these things, you're trying to balance them, right? That's the, that's the whole concept. And so they do the volumetric design and they come out with, okay, our, our air voids in our, our volumetric design, our optimum binder content is 5.6%. So they would be over here, they did the testing and they got a 50 on their ideal CT and they're crushing it on their rutting. So that's the mix that would normally go down there. And you're like, okay, this is the new goal here is to balance this to get a higher cracking index. So they say, everybody says, all right, we've got to move to a higher binder content, move up to 6.0, give us a buffer. We'll pass our ideal CT probably. And your mix just got way more expensive, right? And that's why a lot of people in Alabama are frustrated with balanced mix design right now. Um, but there's other ways to slice this, right? Is this good engineering just to add more binder into our mix? It may not even be possible, right? You're going to throw off your VMA. You're going to you know, your voids are going to be all whacked out. You're going to have to do some different things with your gradation. What, um, what we're trying to challenge people to think about is what happens if you do this at cooler temps? So we do a little bit of a breakdown looking at the ideal CT test. So the CT index, most people are familiar with the old, you know, the old TSR, the ITS, that system that that's run on. Obviously, this is a different test. But... Um, if you think about that peak load, um, you can see uh, everybody kind of focuses on that when you run one of these tests, right? You see that peak load, peak loads, bigger peak loads better, but that's not actually what the calculation is, right? So you see on here that this area under the curve, the work done on the pill, the, the fracture energy is that work, that area under the curve. And so you need to take that and it gets divided by the slope and then it's multiplied by the length until they get to that peak 75. So what does all that mean? So you take two samples here. So this is a hot mix in the red and a warm mix in the blue. Same project, just 30 degrees F difference in temperatures, 375, or, or excuse me, 305 versus 275 mix temperatures. It's the only difference in these samples. And what, what we did is I, I made an example to break down kind of how this is calculated, right? So we, we just talked about that work, that area under the curve is important. That's one of the big terms. So you've got that. And, you know, maybe the one on the left's a little bigger. It's definitely taller, but the one on the right, maybe, maybe a little broader. I don't know. So the area may be similar, let's say. Then we look at that slope value, the M75. So this is an absolute value. So that, don't think about the negative. Just think about which one's a bigger number. So this um, absolute value, this one on the left here, the M75 is steeper. So that's, you're just dividing by a bigger number. So that hurts your hot mix samples, ideal CT right there. So the, this test really picks up that brittle, brittle failure mechanism is what it's designed to do. And then you've got the link to the 75, the peak 75. So the one on the left, what is that? 3.75 basically. And the one on the right, uh, four and a half or so. So that link is significantly bigger on the right. So that's going to be a multiplier. So now, instead of in, just intuitively thinking that the bigger, bigger HMA peak is going to make this a better ideal CT, you're looking at the two samples like, yeah, hey, maybe not so sure. So these are actually the values down here at the bottom of all those different things. You can see the area, the, the warm mix one actually has an advantage there, but it has a big advantage on the other two metrics, the slope and the length. So the CT index on the one on the left, not very good. It's a 20. CT index on the one on the right is a 42. So not something that you necessarily see just picking up a data file and looking at it, but it's interesting to think about how this test is really designed and I fit similar, um, but these, these tests are really designed to see, does the sample crack in a brittle failure mode or not? Does it show more resilience? And this test is gaining a lot of popularity across the country for being a balanced mix design metric or a QC metric or whatever. 
uh, QCQA. Um, so we, we went on from there to look at, okay, what if we take a mix design and run it warm right, versus hot plus the 2% AC and see how we do on CT index, see if these things that we think are going to be there are going to show up. And so you see here, this is a, this is a mix out of Texas, actually, 7% um, air voids, and you've got the warm mix, on, the hot mix on its own had a 192 CT index. So this is a really strong mix. This is like an SMA. And then adding AC to it, it bumped it up. But the two warm mix technologies, even with the same AC content, are performing at the level of the added AC hot mix. So... It's cool to see some of these things we were thinking, you know, the more resilient binder, the, the binder that's not been damaged as much in the plant setting is going to perform better on these tests. It's also going to age better, right? Um, so if you take that further, we look and say, okay, so what does that do to the Hamburg, right? Things get softer, maybe concerned about rutting. Um, so the top yellow line there is your hot mix. This, you know, this just the offset for compaction is what you see here. So if it says compacted at 275, the mix is made at, uh, I believe, 300. Same thing with the warm mix. It's compacted at 240 means it was made at 275. So you see the warm mix, you, you are a little bit softer. At the end, 20,000 passes, you're at seven millimeters of rutting instead of six, somewhere in there. But the hot mix that you added um, two tenths of AC to now has a stripping inflection point and is starting to drop off at the end. So as engineers thinking about what's the best for our system, the adding AC thing really can kind of create problems, right? And everybody says that balance mix design is, you know, French for two tenths or whatever, but um, there's, there's, as engineers, we've got to do better to figure out how to, to optimize our systems really with the test that we have. It's not just as simple as adding AC usually, but the warm mix at cooler temperatures gives you a real tool that's not going to impact your rutting significantly to compare with what what your initial hot mix stats would be for your balanced mix design so if we take this further you know you can do we did all sorts of ways to slice the data for this project but we extracted the binder from those samples and looked back at just the binder properties kind of like what we saw earlier you say okay we should expect to see something because of the temperature difference and we did right so the uh that the mix with a little more asphalt actually was a the top end was less stiff than the other hot mix, which is interesting. Maybe you get a thicker film, but the low temperatures, the warm mixes that made it cooler temperatures on the low temperature side have about two degrees or so, degree and a half to two better than the two hot mix ones. So you see those binder data, that binder data showing up again, how something that's not overheated or, or is done at cooler temperatures is going to have a softer, more resilient binder there. So taking this further, right? So this is the first project we kind of edited out on. We've done a couple of different ones now. These are field mixes from different states. First one up top is from Virginia, uh, SMA there. So you've got a um, 76 on your hot mix with two and a half millimeters of rutting. We went warm. We, same thing. We dropped it from 305 to 275. So not a huge offset. This is not unrealistic mix temperatures. These are real projects with real temperature offsets, 305 to 275. And this is, it went up to 100 on the CT index with just some minimal change to the rutting, right? Three millimeters instead of two and a half, well within the spec on the Hamburg. California mix, when they were dabbling with looking at some of this stuff in one of the districts, we did a project and you can see um, you've got a bump up in the ideal CT, not quite as big as we would have expected there, but you still see an impact. The IFIT going from 3.8 to 5.7 is actually statistically significant. Those are statistically different numbers. Um, the warm mix here, you know, a lot of the times a warm mix chemistry acts as an adhesion promoter. So that's probably not a good head to head there. This system uh, would have probably benefited from the additive in that system. Um, but you can see still, even with the warm mix at cooler temperatures, this was a bigger temperature offset to about 60 degrees here. And the rutting still um, wasn't, an, wasn't an issue here. But you see a nice bump on the ideal CT numbers. So take it further. This is, goes back to the Virginia project. It's something we hit on earlier. There's other ways to do this system, to impact these systems, right? And recycling aids or modifiers are very popular in different areas. So that was one thing that was evaluated here. And you see your two columns on the left here is the comparison we saw earlier, right? You went from a 76 on that ELCT to 103. 
Well, you put 2% modifier in both of those and you go to a, you jumped up about 40 or 50 in both scenarios. So there's a big shift there, right? 76 to 126, just using the modifier, but you also go from 103 to 143 using the modifier with warm mix. So there's a step change with the modifiers. There's also a big step change with the, with the temperature. And um, temperature is something that a lot of times those additives, the warm mix additives they're putting in there are low dosages and a high impact for that low dosage amount of additive in there. Um, so just cool to see some different ways to slice the balance mix design thinking and how to engineer a mix using the tools we have other than just increasing binder content. Um, so application side, we'll hit on a couple things here um, and then loop back around to finish up talking about the temperature thing. But, you, you know, it's, it's great that we can lower temperatures and we, th we think we're going to see better results. But there's a lot of other, you know, benefits to um, warm mix out there that a lot of people have hit on. One of the things that we try to highlight, um, people hear about better density and different things, but a lot of people don't necessarily break down how warm mix gives you better density. So that's the next couple of slides that hit on that for a couple minutes here. So some of you probably might be familiar with the Pave Cool software. You can get on there and put your mix inputs in and it'll kind of give you an idea for how long you have to compact a mix or how susceptible you might be to if you have a cold day with wind speed. Um, so this is an example, kind of what we've talked about before. There's a 30 degree offset here. Then there's a 70 degree window for compaction. So for the hot mix, that window is from about 290. When it gets out to the grade, say that the project's really close to the plant, you don't lose much temperature. So 290 to 220. And you've got 10 minutes while your mix is cooling to do breakdown and what you need to do in that, that window until the mix hits 220. Um, that's what the Pave Cool software breaks it down. And there's, there's different reasons for that too, right? You got a two inch lift. This example, it's about 50 degrees. So you can change all those inputs, but this is the example that we're using here. Um, so you've got about, you know, you've got 10 minutes in this window to get, to get break, to get breakdown. And the warm mix scenario, we kind of all know that th things that are th th laws of thermodynamics, things that are hotter are going to, are cooling faster than something that's, it's lower temperature, it's not gonna cool as quickly. And you can see that on the curve, right? That's what this curve is, right? Material that's up higher high on it, steeper slope, it's cooling faster. Um, so the warm mix made it 275, it gets out at 260. And that same 70 degree window um, allows you to have compaction doing breakdown for almost 20 minutes. So 18 minutes, so you've got an 80% increase. So people talk about warm mix opening up the compaction window. This is one of the things that maybe that isn't always intuitive is realize that because you're working with cooler mix it's not cooling as quickly you're in your ideal range for a lot longer time so that really opens up that window and that, that's super helpful on different we weather challenges and stuff to be able to compact in that cooler temperature range and we see that in cold weather paving right that we use that to our advantage is still be able to get compaction at cooler temperatures because our mixes aren't cooling as fast at those temperatures and it's a big advantage um, the other piece of it, though, is with mix, um, you know, the warmer mix, the hotter mix cooling more rapidly, you're going to get more temperature variation. So this is an example, right? You've, you've got a couple hundred or you got a, several stations here and the difference here, you know, from right here, you got a 240 mix behind the screen temperature and you got a 305. So you've got 60 something degrees difference. And this hot mix example, same project mix is coming out at cooler temperatures and you're very consistent, right? The biggest temperature variation in here is about 25 degrees. So not only do you open up that window, you stay more consistent in that window. And that's, that's kind of some of the science behind how, how warm mix, especially chemical warm mix, help you get compaction. Uh, that's, there's, there's other pieces to it, right? That, you, that workability, that lubricity of the ball bearings, that the chemistry in there are super important but they really unlock these other advantages of being able to make payments at cooler temperatures and the advantages that they give you. Um, this is super important, right? And if you're trying to pave in cooler weather, so people do different strategies. Um, and if a number of you guys are probably very familiar with cool weather paving, trying to squeeze in a project late season, um, sometimes you may have to pave in cooler weather and don't want to. Um, Evertherm, chemical warm mix can be a huge advantage there. Um, some different typical things we talk about with, with um, users is about 
you know, you can increase your dosage to help compensate for cooler weather that can help open up that window even more. Um, things to check, you know, we, a lot of times you keep the warmer temperature, hotter temperatures in that application. Then when you're play, to, to kind of give yourself more time down that curve. Um, also it's important to check the additive viscosity, depending on the day and your temperature, you may need to heat that. Um, we also try to avoid doing, you know, the specialty work, thin lifts, high polymer projects, that those type things can be done with the right dosage and right strategy. Um, so other, you know, the other issue there, you know, there's, there's a lot of troubleshooting that has to happen at the grade, but there's also a lot of troubleshooting that happens to happen at a plant. You know, plants aren't really made to run in, or be started up in cold temperatures, right? So that's a trick. Uh, checking your equipment, making sure everything's working. Um, there's different tricks for, you know, dealing with your aggregate. You guys are probably familiar with some of those. But watching for binding, insulation on your lines is huge. There's a classic story, um, the friend here at Ingevity, some of you may know him, uh, Tim O'Connell's been around our industry for a while, but he was at a cold weather paving project in, um, I believe it was Minnesota, actually. And, uh, you know, Ace, the, um, the line was, the lift gate wasn't opening on the, uh, on the silo to dump, dump the asphalt. So they thought it was frozen the water was in the hydraulic line and they went up there at the blowtorch to try to melt that and it melted the wrong line, melted the electrical conduit and that silo is filling up and they are done. They couldn't open it. So um, there could be some horror stories of cold weather paving, right? So it's important to make sure that you've had a, had a run through. If you're using an additive for the first time that we're going to, Hey, we're going to be able to get density in cold weather. There's a lot on the plant side that has to be worked through. Um, to, to be confident additive is not going to help the machinery at the plant work well. Um, and you guys know that, but yeah, we definitely, and people like um, Adam Schaefer in your area can really help if you're having some um, challenging projects like that they, to come alongside and, and uh, help troubleshoot. Um, also, you know, different tips for cold weather stuff out on the grade, you know, un, you know, unloading your hotter trucks first so you get your paper warmed up, um, living material transfer, obviously, you know, tarping trucks, um, all those type things, limiting handwork, and then using that pave cool or the multi cool app to try to see where you're going to be uh, temperature wise is super helpful. Um, so the change gears again, go back. Um, I know we got a little bit later on time. I will finish up in the next couple of minutes, though, and we can do some questions. Um, uh, you think about the temperature piece and how we see that lowering temperatures may help us get a, a better aging binder in our system. And that then we think will show up on this cracking test like CT index, like IFIT. We've taken that, we want to take that a step further. A lot of different agencies are using the different um, design guides. We want to have an integrated approach where based on the traffic level, the climate, all those different things, people run dynamic modulus, data or they might use direct tension there's different ways for the for like the flex pave software with the me guides but then you can put if you run those at cooler temperatures can you calibrate those design guides to show that they should that mix will last longer and that's some of the things that we're we're working on now and that we think that can, will be done here in the next few years in that next decade of warm mix we're talking about showcasing the benefit of lower temperatures and designing for pavement improvement think it's going to be important. So we'll, you would take your dynamic modulus samples um, or whichever test, fatigue test you need to look at, age those um, at cooler temperatures with respect to what would be the warm mix temperatures um, or produce those at cooler temperatures. And then you see that offset or that improved performance, incorporate that into your design model. So um, the, here's the example where, where that's been done. Actually, this is a project uh, just north of you guys in Canada, where you've got, if we just look at the top half of this graph, you've got observed field data on the left, and then you got predicted on the right. So we look at the predicted. This is a, uh, this is a warm mix comparison project from about 10 years ago. And you could see that um, Sassabit wasn't really predicted to do that well, but you've got the control based on temperature, and then you've got, um, you've got the damage area predicted for the evatherm that was supposed to be made with cooler temperatures and the equivalent single axle load here, as it goes up, you're gonna see more cracking, but the damage area should be lower because of the cooler temperatures. 
then you go over to the top left quadrant one and you see that, that actually showed up they all they, the discrepancy was bigger than they expected but they all trended kind of what the expectation was so the evatherm section did show less area this is about a six-year survey after they put this project down this is published i thought i had the, the link on the bottom but i could add that and send out the presentation um, but based on you know this study they saw they predicted about a 25 percent improvement in the um, the correct area, the damaged area based on the cooler temperatures, and they saw a huge improvement, ninety percent. Um, so we're looking to 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 add to this type data set to showcase that hey, if we can design with a longer service life in mind, due to reduced temperatures, that that could that could really be an asset for our industry going forward from an agency perspective. And we're looking at st some studies right now that would continue to showcase that. Um, other, other things to talk about, right? So, uh, and this is just a cost per mixed ton um, guesstimate on the left. This is not a, any particular mix. This is just a placeholder. Um, and this is something that always comes up, right? Cost of the additive, how do you offset the cost? Well, there's all sorts of things listed here about how the cost can be pulled back. But, um, you know, if, you, if your area does specify an adhesion promoter, that's, that's huge. But a lot of um, a lot of areas don't, right? So if you can increase your wrap and still age just as well, like we saw in some of our binder data, that's huge. Um, some areas have absorptive rocks, so you get some AC back by running at lower temperatures. Um, density bonuses, um, you know, extended season, we hit on that a little bit. And then the longer service life piece, something we're really hoping to help agencies capture here in the next couple of years as an advantage for, for, for their states on, you know, you got the same effort going into putting down a pavement, but you make it warmer temperatures, cooler temperatures, is it gonna perform longer? We think it will. We think this data strongly suggests it will. So that's something that's, it's, it's held there at two on here, but that could really be a much bigger multiplier if you're getting 25 or 30% 30, 30 life extension out of a pavement. Um, so, you know, environmental benefits is something that are becoming even more trendy, right? Um, looking at, uh, you know, the, one of the, 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 uh, the CO2 equivalent pounds of CO2 produced by creating an additive is very small. It's 1.3 pounds up here. The same fuel reduction, this is an average of fuels. So if you do natural gas, this cuts this down, I think to about a third, around three. But, you know, you, could, you can offset the additive just by the fuel, um, the fuel reduction of CO2. Then if you're replacing something like lime or you're able to, increase your wrap. There's a lot of ways to show benefits as far as a CO2 reductions piece for our industry. And that's really something that we wanna help showcase to our industry going forward. We've hit on this kind of three pillars thing today, but we think the evidence is strong that if you make these mixes at cooler temperatures, you're gonna keep the better parts of your asphalt in your mix. That's gonna help you age better. That's gonna show up um, on your mixture testing, it's going to help us with balance mix design in the, as far as build a better, better mousetrap for balance mix design. It's going to help us incorporate more recycle and still get improved results. And then we'll take that and be able to showcase that to the agency and say, now we can design for this, to, these payments to last longer because we're consistently running our mixes at lower temperatures. So appreciate you guys' time um, a lot today, and I apologize for the hiccups to start with the, um, my computer locking up off the bat um, on the presentation. But we can definitely, uh, and this is just contact info for me and Craig and Adam Schaefer, who's a field engineer that um, does a lot of work um, with Craig in Wisconsin there. But we can definitely do a couple questions now um, on the chat, or we can unmute. And um, just thank you guys so much for um, your time and, and attending today. So I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see everything. Can, is everybody able to unmute, Trey or? Yes, I have, okay. yep, I turned that back on. Everybody can unmute themselves. So, and I appreciate you, Brandon, um, setting this up for us. Super helpful. Hope this um, it's going to be something that we can be an advantage for our industry going forward. Yeah, we appreciate that, Trey. We appreciate Ingevity putting this on. I know that there were a couple people that 
um, wanted to join, but had scheduling conflicts. So um, if you're able to share the recording, I know that you guys recorded this. Um, I will definitely get that sent out to a few of the folks who weren't able to join us. Um, but appreciate all of the WAPA members who were able to join. I know that there are a few DOT folks on the line as well. So um, now would be a good time if there are any questions for Craig or Trey um, to unmute yourself and um, ask those questions now. Yeah, Brandon, you're right. We did record it. So I'll send that to you and you can disseminate as you, as you see fit. Well, thanks, well, Brandon. You've done a great job. <laughs> thanks, Craig. The there, so. And if there are questions that come up, you know, there's a lot of information there that I broke down in a relatively quick amount of time. So if they have questions about a particular project, for example, like I didn't break down the optimum binder content and the gradation of individual projects and different things like that, which matter when you're doing a balanced mix design kind of scenario. So if somebody does have um, questions regarding something specific, we can definitely um, put some time into answering that. So definitely email us directly or something like that. Trey, this is Andrew Hands. Hey, Andrew, oh, how you doing? Doing well, Trey, how are you? Good. I had a quick question. You're showing uh, different results with the effects of lower temperatures. Are there other states that have mix design conditioning protocols in place to account for lab conditioning of hot mix versus warm mix and how to use these performance tests? So you're talking about like an ASHTO R30 type thing where you would lower the temperature for warm mix. Is that kind of your, your short-term aging Correct. and stuff? Yeah, yeah, so that's a big – so a lot of the times you're doing four hours at a specific temperature, and that's not with regard to um, – it's without regard to what the mix temperature was initially. And so that's kind of an equalizer as far as how mix is going to look in those tests. And, yeah, there are states that are looking at that. Um, Texas is a good example. Texas and Oklahoma are looking at that, aging at lower temperatures. Um, I think Virginia is. I'd have to go check on some of the other ones that we've we've done or some of these showcase projects in. But yeah, that's a big that's a big thing, right? So if you're gonna do an ash to R30, four hours of aging, uh, but you're gonna just age it all at whatever. If you're gonna age it all at 300 or, or 280, that's gonna be pretty impactful. As, making that gap narrow from the example, which is not really relevant to the, at the field. It's you're going to, if you have a temperature offset, it's going to exist through the whole, um, uh, it's going to exist through the whole piece of the lay down of the material. Is that, is that, I, we can dig and see what other states are yeah, looking at no, that I, there, Andrew. I, that answers the question. I just think that some of the benefits that you saw in the ideal testing won't be realized if the mixes are being conditioned correctly. Yep. Yeah, that's a real issue. Totally agree. Yeah, so all of these three. examples are four hours. Those ideal examples are all four hours short-term aging. Um, the lab one was, and then the uh, one of the field aging didn't have the four hours. It was just straight from the field mix. Um, so yeah, those, those basically what I'm saying with what Andrew's comment was, is all those had an offset on the aging. Otherwise it would have probably changed that data. Trey, this is Mike Burns. Um, just, um, you may know that Wisconsin has their cold weather paving specification, which requires, you know, an additive. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, I'm just wondering what you're seeing in other states and what kind of dosages and temperatures there are, are that you're seeing or any other states even doing it. Yeah, there are other locations that do some of that. Craig could chime in on that too. I know um, Illinois does some cold weather. Minnesota has some at times. Um, uh, yeah, that's it's an interesting trade-off, right? If you're going to pave in cold weather and try to squeeze more tonnage in, but you make your mix at 340 because it's a 35-degree day, you know, what's your trade-off there? You get your mix down, but um, did you damage it a bit? if you're looking at this data, it would suggest that that maybe is not the best practice. 
maybe the better practice is with, you know, to up your additive dosage and to be more aggressive with temperature on some of those days. Um, yeah, Craig, do you want to chime in on some of the different states that are doing the cold temperature? Yes, yeah, some of that. There's quite a few different um, specifications. And like in the city of Chicago, they actually have a date spec that on November 1st through May 1st, you have to use a chemical warm mix in, the, um, in any mix that's put down between those dates because they used to have, you know, 40 and rising or whatever it was. <clears throat> And then the um, producers would start off in the morning at the end and they'd want to pull it out and stuff. So they just put a flat date on there and then they pay for the, um, that they, then they know the additive's going to be in there. Um, the tollway, Illinois doesn't have a spec per se as far as cold weather, but a lot of times the, um, the DOT engineer will work with the producer. And if it's getting down cold where it's below where they would typically allow it, sometimes they'll meet and waive the, um, warranty or the guarantee and go ahead and put chemical warm mix in there and most of it's hebotherm. So it's it's still varying, Mike. It should be, I think there should be a spec across the Midwest with something and maybe not as far as like heating up the temperature, but like Trey said, if you guys would traditionally run it from 320 during the summertime up to 340, 350, maybe go up to the 320 or 310 and just add a little bit more um, hebotherm in there to get the workability and the compaction aid out in the field, but not still super cook it. Then does Minnesota have a temp spec? Or a date? They do not. Okay. And there are other places too outside the Midwest. I know like you could go an extreme example, like Alaska does a bunch of chemical warm mix depending on time of year. I know they have a spec around that. Yep. I see Eric's raising his hand. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Sure, sure. Thank you, Trey and Craig. Yeah, this is Eric Lanoff from WISDOT. I had a question about sort of temperature sensitivity for mixture design type. I know that, you know, different mixes might age differently. You know, we have our LTs, MTs, and HTs, and SMAs here in Wisconsin. Are you noticing any patterns as far as balanced mix design measurements are concerned? Are some mix types more sensitive to that aging temperature than other types? Sorry if I missed, I missed the first part of your presentation. So sorry if you covered it. No, 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 no. I appreciate the question. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of the data I looked at here was a broad spectrum of mixes, right? And then um, was the binder data is independent of mix type really. So, um, you know, you do have certain mixes with that aggregate interlock and, you know, thicker binder film thickness like an SMA performs better on some of those mix tests, right? So. Um, with regard to age, um, we think it really comes down to the film thickness of the, um, the binder in the system. It has a big part in that. So um, it's another reason why some of those SMAs do really well. Um, it's, it depends on some of those other mixes. If we're, you could probably pick out and we, different people, we could pick out an area. And I, you know, I live in South Carolina, so I know certain mixes around town, they run them dry, right? those don't age very well. Um, so um, drier mixes, and that shows up on the, on the balanced mix design test, but that also shows up on some of the aging protocol. You get a thin, thinner film and those stiffen more rapidly. So lower temperature can have a big impact in that space. Does that make sense? Yeah, you answered my question, thank you. Well, if there's no more questions, like I said, Trey will get that, um, the recording of this over to Brandon. If anybody, you know, Eric, if you want to see the first, whatever you missed, you said you missed a little bit at the beginning, maybe um, Brandon can forward that over to you and you can look at the beginning of that. Again, if any of you guys have any questions as far as if you want more detail, Trey and I are more than happy. You know, we don't like to do these more than an hour just because we're taking up a lot of people's time. But if there is more data that you want, we're always happy to sit down and share with you. I mean, we can go more in depth, like Trey had mentioned earlier. We're always happy to do that, but some people like to hear, you know, just an hour and we're good. And some people see that and say, boy, we'd love to get a little bit more detailed information on something else. We can sit down on that. 
with you as far as balanced mix design going forward. Trey is always very welcome to help out anybody out as far as any of the producers in the state or the DOT to look at any testing or see what we can do to help you out. And then Adam and myself too, I mean, any one of us can go out to your lab, to your plant, work with you out in the field, anything that anybody wants, we're always able to do that. So if nobody else has any more questions, we just ran over a little bit here due to technical difficulties in the age that we're living in here with the um, virtual instead of in-person. So we sure appreciate everybody taking an hour out of their busy lives and their busy days. And, and please get a hold of us if we can help you out with any more. If you want to forward this video on to anybody else, Brandon will have that here shortly. And again, really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Guys. Okay, Debbie, thanks. Mm -hmm.